On the 23rd of September 1586, an enormously tragic event occurred on the east bank of the River Moy that was to change the course of history for Mayo, Connacht and Ireland. That event was the Battle of Ardnery. In 1585, the composition of Connacht was an enforced agreement between the Gaelic chiefs of Connacht and the English administration and was part of the Tudor conquests of Ireland, designed to bring the province under English rule. This would have similar stinging socio-economic and political effect as the surrender and regrant policy of Henry VIII in the mid-16th century. Elizabeth was the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, his second wife who was executed two and a half years after Elizabeth's birth. The marital history of her father, the six times married Henry VIII, had been nightmarish for his children due to the insecurity it brought and the potential dangers for them within the intrigues of the royal court. He had hounded his first wife, Catherine, to death, executed two others, including Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, and terrorized two of the other three. Perhaps not unsurprisingly, Elizabeth herself was shaped by this upbringing. Despite having many suitors, she never married. People rarely failed her. When they did, they lost their head. Elizabeth wanted to have firm control of Ireland due to her fears that her enemies, especially King Philip II of Spain and his powerful empire, would join forces with Irish rebels. Her fear was that he would send his armies to Ireland and could use them to attack England from their vulnerable west flank. To negate this, England supported Spain's enemies in the Netherlands in a proxy war, while Elizabeth I attempted to complete the Tudor conquests of Ireland. The Irish question would be one that would plague her for most of her reign, but the question of how to govern Ireland was one of the most difficult issues, either through fair means or foul. Her Irish administration's leader was Sir John Perrow, as Lord Deputy of Ireland. Perrow was allegedly Queen Elizabeth's half-brother. Perrow was dispatched to Ireland in 1571 as President of Munster, with orders to suppress and bring to heel the Gaelic and Anglo-Irish lords who had rebelled. He resigned his post in 1573 and returned to London without permission. After spending the interim in Wales and having to leave under a cloud, he returned to Ireland in 1584 as Lord Deputy, with the orders to crush the Irish and appropriate their lands. Sir Richard Bingham was appointed Governor of the Presidency of Connacht in 1584. Combined with Perrault, they would control Ireland as a military dictatorship, utilising famine, fire and martial law to bring Ireland to heel. Far from creating the conditions for triumph of the common law, absolutist agencies such as Bingham's merely sought to provoke an eradication of those who stood in their way. In 1586, Sir Richard Bingham was on a crusade in Connacht, while the Privy Council in the Pale attempted to govern a fractured and resistant country. Perrow was effectively undermining Bingham's mandate, causing Bingham to warn him that his position would have a negative effect on the campaign in Connacht. Bingham was a ruthless English naval officer and a soldier who was sent to Ireland to impose the Queen's will through fire and sword. From Dorset, England, he was one of 11 children. He was the youngest in the family and junior to his two brothers, John and George, both of whom would serve under him as sheriffs in Mayo and Sligo. He was said to have had enormous thirst for Irish blood and was universally despised by the local people because of his barbaric cruelty. He came here initially to suppress the second Desmond Rebellion in 1579. On his arrival, he was involved in the Siege of Smerwick, 
with the successful lifting of the siege on the promise of quarter. Subsequently, the English massacred the surviving Spanish papal troops on the 10th of November, 1580. In 1584, Bingham was appointed Governor of Connacht, Lord President of Connacht, and was assigned the task of imposing the composition of Connacht and of suppressing Mayo rebels. It is said he reigned over Connacht with neither justice nor mercy, gaining the name the Flail of Connacht by those subjugated by his merciless governance. In 1586, County Mayo had just recently been formally established and Connacht was not yet totally under English law, with the north of the country still in the hands of the Gaelic lords. Although the Burks held most of the power in the region, Fierce feuding weakened any cohesive strategy to withstand Bingham's ever-increasing pressure, ensuring the English could exploit disputes and set brother against brother and neighbour against neighbour, thus destabilising the gales and ensuring no potential unified challenge could occur. The Burks were an Anglo-Norman noble family who were said to have, over the centuries, become more Irish than the Irish themselves. They refused to accept the composition being imposed on them and were treated as rebels as they fought to preserve their ancestral lands. But they submitted when they had to and used the English against their enemies' clans as needed. After the death of their chieftain, Richard Burke, Queen Elizabeth's administration forbade that the Burkes allow a new claimant to the McWilliamship, which means the clan leader. As the main allies of the Burkes, the Joys, O'Malleys, McFiblins and McGibbons had ensured the excesses of Bingham's brutal administration and with no end in sight of the executions and being cornered by his judicial sessions, Bingham had managed to unite the Gael and Anglo-Irish against him. This would result in a call to arms and a rising out, an eerie amach, in an open challenge to English rule. With the Mayo rebels now in open revolt and Elizabeth's proxies pursuing a scorched earth policy, total and absolute war had come to Connacht. England's policy towards Ireland was that rebellious areas should be spoiled, wasted and burned. Bingham in later years described Grania Whale in a letter as the nurse of all rebellions in the province for 40 years. Her connection to the story of Ardnery is best told by another Mayo woman, author, historian and Grania Whale subject matter expert Anne Chambers. Anne writes that a battle which resulted in the deaths of over 3,000 people has been largely ignored by Irish history down through the centuries at first may appear amazing. The Battle of Kinsale in 1601, by comparison, which resulted in the loss of 1,200 lives, has become an iconic milestone in our national history. Perhaps both the nationality and the motivation of those involved in the battle which took place at Ardnery, County Mayo, in September 1586, may well have contributed to that omission. Anne first came across references to this battle in her research for the biographies of Grace O'Malley and that of her son, Tibbet Nalong Burke, the future Viscount Mayo. Both mother and son were also largely airbrushed out of the national narrative as they failed to conform to the post-colonial ideology as Ireland began to re-engage and imagine its place in the world and itself. Survival both in the physical as well as the political sense, rather than any ideological motivation such as patriotism or nationalism, which at the time was every chieftain's more basic but understandable spur, thus ensuring their dissipation from official history associated with the period, such as the Battle of Ardnery. In 1585, the English Lord Deputy Sir John Perrault introduced a new system of governance known as the Composition of Connacht, which sought to abolish the customs and laws of the indigenous Brehan system and replace them with English laws. This affected all aspects of life, including the way in which Gaelic chieftains were elected to office, as distinct from the English system of primogeniture, and by which 
they had governed their individual territories for generations. Through a combination of coercion, fear, as well as for personal gain and advancement, the majority of the Gaelic chieftains signed the composition, including the most powerful chieftain in Mayo, the MacWilliam. By Gaelic custom, every chieftain in the county was bound to the MacWilliam by the payment of annual tributes known as cuttings and spendings, as well as by obligatory military service. Consequently, this was a title which the English composition sought to abolish. While Perrault was the architect of the composition, its implementation on the ground was left to Sir Richard Bingham, the English governor of Connacht. The methods by which Bingham sought to subdue the Connacht chieftains included execution by martial law, including the young and elderly, torture, scorched earth warfare, as well as hostage taking. A professional soldier and military tactician, a thorough administrator, Bingham's singular failing was his inflexibility and rigid adherence to orders, as well as a racism invoked by his mantra, the Irish were never tamed with words, but with swords. He had already shown his propensity for violence, but his feelings regarding Grace O'Malley and her family highlighted his tunnel vision when it came to a grudge, be it justified or not, but there is little doubt he sought to put this powerful woman back in her place, being that she was unique for her time. There is no doubt he viewed her as a threat to him, and being a woman made his feelings more resolute and irrational. He accused her of being a drawer-in of Scots, the famous Gallaglass mercenaries. It was deemed a treasonable offence to consort, hire or bring in mercenaries from Scotland at the time. As a deterrent, in 1584, Bingham seized her youngest son, Tibbet Nalong Burke. He was sent as a hostage to his brother, George Bingham, at Ballymote Castle in Sligo. In July 1586, her eldest son, Owen O'Flaherty, married to the daughter of Edmund Burke of Castle Bar, as Grace testified, was cruelly murdered, having 12 deadly wounds near Omi Island in Connemara by the governor's brother, Captain John Bingham. When the MacWilliam of Mayo, Richard Burke, died in January 1586, the Gaelic and English systems regarding succession collided. When the elected Tornishta, by Gaelic law, Edmund Burke of Castle Bar, was denied the title and extensive lands, castles and tributes that go with it in favour of Richard Burke's eldest son, by English law, his legal successor, the Burkes of Mayo and their allies, O'Malley's, MacPhilbans, and McGibbons rose in rebellion against Bingham. They were joined by Tibbet Burke following his release from custody in Sligo, and by his mother, who, with her galleys, brought in a contingent of Galloglass from Scotland to aid the rebellion against Bingham. In retaliation, Bingham executed many of the young Burke children who were hostages in his custody, and with a large army, devastated the lands of those in rebellion, taking a huge prey of their cattle herds. On a plundering raid into Grace O'Malley's territory on the north shore of Clue Bay, she later recorded she was apprehended and tied with rope, spoiled of her castle and brought to Sir Richard, who caused a new pair of gallows to be made for her where she thought to end her days. The rebellion fizzled out when Bingham captured the Taunishta Edmund Burke. He was tried for treason and despite his great age, executed with his Castlebar estate later acquired by Bingham's relations, became forfeit to the Crown. By August 1586, most of the Mayo Burks and their allies had entered peace negotiations with Bingham. When news broke that a huge army of Scottish mercenaries was on the march through Ulster en route to Mayo to help the Burke rebellion, the sons of Edmund Burke broke from the negotiations to join them. Grace O'Malley, who, as part of the peace negotiations, had been released from custody by Bingham, set off in her galleys towards Ulster. Whether to provide transport for the approaching Scottish force is unclear, but in her later evidence she claims that en route, her galleys, by a tempest being broken, she was obliged to remain in Ulster until they were repaired. If only Grace O'Malley had returned to Mayo before Bingham's attack, could her presence have been enough to turn the tide 
of the slaughter of the Galloglass. Ustin MacDonald was the leader of the somewhat obscure Galloglass of Mayo, who was based in the barony of Kilmaine. He was described as the leading Clan Donald member of his time. The English government's decision in the summer of 1586 to abolish the Gaelic title of MacWilliams, Octor, and thereby impose English land ownership system in Mayo sparked a rebellion in the county, to which MacDonald gave his support. However, the scorched earth tactics of Sir Richard Bingham, President of Connacht, quickly broke the rebellion, and a gaunt, half-starved MacDonald submitted to Bingham in August, handing over one of his sons as a pledge of his future good behaviour. In September, MacDonald was present at the Battle of Ardnery, but was pardoned on the 23rd of November 1587. For years before the Ardnery event, the Galloglass had been used as professional warriors in Irish battles. They descended from the Norse Vikings, who settled with the people of the Western Highlands of Scotland and the Hebrides, and were regarded as a professional fighting force in Ireland for almost 400 years. The Galloglass were Gaelic-speaking Scots who were accompanied into battle by two assistants, Kearns, who were usually of Irish military class who carried weaponry and supplies for the warriors. In the battle, the Galloglass were the vanguard, our first men forward into action, and in retreat, they were the last men back in the rear guard. They did not work apart from fighting, and they were proficient with the sword and axe. They were fiercely loyal to whoever their employer in any given battle, and often met their own clansmen on opposing sides. In such case, no quarter was asked nor given. They lived and died by the sword, and they did not expect mercy. Neither were they known, generally, for their compassion, although that may or may not have applied to the Scots of the ordinary tragedy. Death was an occupational and inevitable hazard for them. The most famous families of the Galloglass were the McSweeney's, McDonald's, McCabe's and McLeod's. The typical Galloglass warrior was tall in structure, muscular and skillful in the ways of war. They wore a fur wrap with the fur facing out, which is said to have made them look like large bears. They were soldiers of fortune who hired themselves out as fighters for a living. They were known to plunder at will as part of their lifestyle and because of the environment they lived in. The word Galloglass itself is an anglicization of the Gaelic word Galloglach, meaning foreign soldier. One of the favorite weapons of these warriors was a six foot long razor sharp battle axe with a 12 inch cutting edge called the Sparth, a development of the Viking axes of their ancestors. Another of their weapons of choice was the double handed claymore sword derived from the Gaelic words Cleof Moor, which means big sword. Along with their size and physical strength and martial skills in battle, they were also famous for their fearlessness, preferring to die in battle than to yield. In Irish warfare, the Galloglass were used in the open field against other Irish armies, but when they encountered more heavily armed and armoured English troops, Irish commanders preferred to use them as shock troops in ambush. While capable of meeting the English in the open, they were usually outnumbered and they were especially susceptible to archers. Some Galloglass clans were by this time Irish, but the Clan Donalds were still mostly Scots and some Irish. The leaders were the sons of James MacDonald, Donald Gore MacDonald of Kerry and Alexander Cara MacDonald of Glenarm. They set sail from the Western Isles of Scotland with the rugged Atlantic breaking in white foam against the jagged weather-beaten rocks of the coastline. In the summer of 1586, this contingent of Galloglass arrived from Scotland and was based in Inishowen, County Donegal. The Burke sent a messenger to seek their assistance against their feuding enemy clans and against Bingham's forces, who were imposing English rule. William Burke of Ardnery and John Anschlieve Burke were sent into Ulster for the purpose of hiring the Scots as mercenaries. After the customary bargaining, they agreed to aid the Burks, as their ancestors the Clan Donald Galloglass had done since the middle of the 14th century. On the promise of land and pay, they consented to move southwest to Mayo 
with their families to help in the conflict. In early September, a contingent of around 1,400 Galaglass mercenaries and another 1,400 of their wives and children departed from Inishone in Donegal and headed towards Mayo on what was to be an ill-fated journey. Bingham received information that the Scots, after some skirmishes in Maguire's country of Fermanagh, had reached the River Urn. Bingham knew that if he risked open battle, he would be wiped out. Meanwhile, back in Mayo, Bingham had moved swiftly through the county against the rebels. He harried them from bush to bush and treetop to treetop. He then hanged an elderly man, Edmund Burke, in Castle Bar, who was the claimant to the MacWilliam Lordship, which was the leadership of the Burke clan. Although he was in his 80s and had lost a leg in a previous rebellion, he was carried to the gallows and hanged. Bingham also held seven other Burkes and many others until the clan submitted and offered three young sons and relatives as pledges of their future good conduct. Bingham later murdered these children in retaliation for the Burke's rebelliousness and was put on trial twice for his savage treatment of the people of Mayo. Queen Elizabeth later released Bingham, deciding that with all his cruelties, he had not been cruel enough for the Irish. Although word had most likely spread that the attempted rebellion was squashed, the Scots headed for Mayo to settle and crossed the River Urn in County Donegal in late August 1586. The Galloglass made their way through South Fermanagh and towards Sligo. Bingham, realising the threat, began a major recruitment and gunpowder collection in Galway in preparation for the coming fight. Bingham reached out to the Galloglass at Sligo. He sought to know their intentions and why they had come to Connacht. They replied with honesty about their intent, while they were being opposed by a person who responded with deception. The Scott mercenary leadership, Donald Gore MacDonnell, and Alexander Cara MacDonnell, son of James MacDonnell, wrote to Bingham that they are come over the urn with a great number of men, being drawn in by the Clan Williams and the Clan Donalds, who are their cousins, and they shall give them entertainment and the spoil of Connacht. And James MacDonnell, his sons, have no other shift but to take an enterprise upon themselves, for such will give them most, as all other soldiers in the world do use. And whoever in Connacht shall forbid them, or let them thereof, they will not take it at their hands, except they be stronger than they, or of greater power. This is sufficient. Signed, I, Donald Gore MacDonald, and I, Alexander Cara MacDonald. This letter was probably written about the 26th of August, 1586. Both of the MacDonald brothers were killed in Ardenry within a month of penning the letter. Bingham mustered an army to meet them, but the Scots were not wanting to engage in battle while burdened by their families, and their main objective was to enter Mayo without a battle and to join up with the main army of the Burks and their co-relatives. Bingham later wrote, I lay at Sligo and at the foot of the Curlews, with my said forces, fronting the Scots and keeping them from entering the country. On their first night in the area, the Scots stayed between the River Duff and the River Droz on the sligo Leitrim border. They then moved towards Dartree along the Benbow Hills. They reached Drumahair, County Leitrim, where they camped for three nights before moving to Kilronan. Meanwhile, Bingham and his army came from the west and stopped at Bellinafad between Sligo and Boyle. Both armies stayed in these places for the next two weeks without either side attacking each other. All along the Scots were careful to keep to high or boggy ground to make it as difficult as possible for the English to attack and the cat and mouse chase ensued between Bingham and his Scots quarry. Bingham was determined to stop the Scots from reaching their destination. Their promised land was Tyrawley, on the west bank of the River Moy, in North Mayo, where they intended to join with the Mayo rebels and form a strong force to defend against all enemies. The Scots marched through bog, wood and mountain, heading for Balahedrine. 
Bingham expected them to attempt a crossing into Mayo through the mountains there. Maybe they were trying to lose their stalker, but they suddenly turned and changed direction towards Caluni, County Sligo. Bingham moved his army to the bridge at Caluni, where he prepared to confront the slowly advancing Scots and waited many days. Of the 3,000 people in the caravan, half were women and children, as well as elderly and sick, and the journey was at all times slow and difficult. The added challenge of being harried by Bingham's army at every opportunity added to the adversity of the hazardous journey. Major storms and inclement weather are a recurring feature of the saga, and they had an enormous impact on the outcome. On a foul and tempestuous night in the middle of September 1586, Bingham's army, which included many Irish cavalry and infantry troops, were guarding the bridge crossing over the Owen Moore River at Caluni. He only stood down his men for the night after he was assured by O'Connor of Sligo that the Scots had camped for the night. Now many of the Irish who served under Bingham had no loyalty to him, and he would soon discover that they would show more loyalty to his enemy than to him. Several of his Irish fighters deserted and informed the Scots that the English had stood down for the night. The Scots made their move. With the greatest of silence, they began to approach and cross the unguarded bridge. Not a single sound was made by almost 3,000 people as they crept through the rain, the sound of the downpour drowning the noise of the feet of the travelling people. About three to four hundred Scots had crossed the bridge when suddenly something, possibly the cry of a baby, alerted the English who advanced hastily towards the bridge. About fifty Scots were killed in this skirmish and Bingham's forces lost five horses. The human death toll would have been much worse except for one factor that infuriated Bingham. The Irish fighters in his ranks went on strike and refused to lift a hand against their Celtic cousins, the Scots. Both infantry and cavalry refused to charge the vulnerable Scots, which allowed many to cross safely. In the face of attack from Bingham's other troops, the Scots retreated and crossed at a fjord at a different point in the river, which the English did not even know existed. They now had potential to access their destination through Schlieve Gav, also known as the Ox Mountains, after the eventful crossing of the river at Caluni. Bingham then heard through his spies that the Scots were not headed north into the barony of Tira, West Sligo. Instead, they were headed towards Roscommon. A confrontation over a 14-day period took place at Balnafad, and the Scots continuously made efforts to reach their intended final destination of Mayo. On September 16th, the Scots reached Balahi, where they turned and backtracked. Bingham tried to block their route and resided at Ard Glass. On the 19th of September, they reached Coolcarney. They were now tantalizingly close to their destination. From their mountaintop position, the Scots could clearly see across North Mayo. Epically beautiful countryside, lakes, rivers, woodlands and bogs lay before them in a breathtakingly beautiful and unspoiled landscape. And on the 20th of September they reached Ardnery. The Scots seized the castle on their arrival and settled in Ardnery and the nearby countryside of Atimas and Bonnie Conlon. Bingham heard through his spies where they were located and wrote from Ardnery on the 23rd of September, the day after the massacre, in a letter to Lord Deputy Perrow, where my spy brought me certain word that they were at Kildermit, or at Ardnery, persuading and practicing with the Burks of Tyrolli to join with them. Ardnery's fascinating history is compiled through research from local historian and author Terry Riley and Eamon Burke from De Burke Rare Books, Dublin, who tell us that the origin of the name goes back to the latter half of the 5th century, Ardnaria meaning the Hill of Executions, owing to the story of four murderers who were taken to a hill near the River Moy and executed by quartering. The four males were quartered at Ardnery and then supposedly buried on Primrose Hill under the dolmen of the four males. In 1208, 
Olif Orathlan, chief of Calry, that is Kulkarni, was slain by O'Morin, who lived at Ardnery. 1266 saw the killing of Donal O'Hegra, king of Lucknay, who was killed while burning Ardnery against the foreigners. In 1371, Donaka Uduva attacked the English at Tira and took Castle Connor and Ardnery castles single-handedly, drove out the English who were in them and parceled up the land to his own people. Thus the Birminghams were finally driven out after 150 years and the O'Dowds held Ardnery until 1530 when it was captured by the Burks. The year 1396 saw Ardnery plundered by MacWilliam, O'Kelly, MacFierus and O'Connor Rowe. In 1402, the death occurred of Mjortek O'Dowd, who it was said never refused anything to a suppliant if he had it to give. He was buried at Ardnery. In 1427, a monastery for Ermites of the Order of St. Augustine was founded at Ardnery. These were Christian reclusive monks. The shell of the monastery still remains today. In 1485, a battle occurred at Ardnery between Theobald Burke and O'Donnell. In 1532, the Burks and the O'Dowds were still on the warpath. O'Dowd took Ardnery from the Burks, but the following year it was recovered by Thomas Burke's son. This incident was the origin of an Irish proverb like the expectation of O'Dowd to regain Ardnery. In 1576, the Burks held Ardnery Castle, but in 1582, Ardnery and Mielik were both garrisoned by Captain Barbazin against the Burks, and so English troops held Ardnery Castle. In 1586, the Galaglass Scots arrived in town and took Ardnery Castle, but three days later, it was again in the hands of the English army under Sir Richard Bingham after the slaughter of the Scots in the most horrific event in the history of the town. With the knowledge that his enemy were near Aclair, Bingham deployed a new tactic. Up until now, his strategy was to stay close to the Scots and to harass and interrupt their convoy whenever possible. Now though, the game changed to hide and go seek. The new strategy was to not interfere with the Scots at all, but to await the reinforcements that had been promised by Lord Deputy Perrault in the Pale. In his efforts to deceive the Scots and to drop their guard, Bingham withdrew from the area completely and went south to Moigara Castle on the banks of Loch Gara. Was this based on false information received by him, or was it, as he claimed, to protect Roscommon from being plundered by the enemy? Bingham also went to Castle Moor near Balhedrin during this time. His quest to build an even larger army and stock up on gunpowder continued, and it is reported that he sourced supplies of gunpowder in Galway. Bingham's latest information from his spies was that the Scots had moved from Cool Kearney on the mountaintop and were camped at a marvellously fast and strong ground on the other side of Schlieve Gav, the Ox Mountains. The Ox Mountains begin immediately southwest of Balasadir and run west to southwest for some 40 miles to the boundary of County Mayo, where they are continued to the southwest by Schlieve Gav Range, which runs first on the boundary of the two counties and then into Mayo. In poor weather, the mountain range cannot be seen from Ardnery as they disappear into the misty low cloud. On a clear day, they form a rich blue backdrop to the splendid countryside around Adimas in Ardnery's hinterland. Bingham was still furious that he'd been let down by his Irish troops who refused to raise a hand against the Scots at the Colony Bridge fighting, and so he dismissed all of the Irish horsemen for doing no service and said that they had done him more harm than good in his efforts to stop the advancing Scots. Bingham was beginning to understand the strength of the relationship between the peoples of Ireland and Scotland, and he did not like what he was seeing in the least. The refusal of the Irish cavalry in Bingham's army to attack civilian women and children while they were crossing a bridge in a storm shows that even war-torn Connacht, human decency was possible. 
Bingham left Castle Moor near Balahedrin and went with his army to Banada Abbey through a pass called Litcher. The night forsook him and his company and they forsook the highway. They crept low and silently as possible towards the peaceful countryside that was soon to be tragically scarred by the events about to be visited upon it. On the day before the battle, the 22nd of September, Bingham heard from a spy that the Scots had left Kulkarni and were camped at Ardnery. Today, Ardnery is a vibrant and colourful community within the townland of Balaná. It offers its dwellers an enormous sense of inclusivity and is very welcoming. Its local football club enjoys legendary support from Ardnery people and the character and strength in the spirit of the people with their proud sporting history is unequalled anywhere. In 1586, Ardnery was a fledgling town with a castle, an abbey and modestly housed early inhabitants. Just as the town was literally attempting to get off the ground and in its early days, it was faced with its darkest ever hours. Apart from being famous as warriors, the new arrivals in town, the Galloglass, were known for enjoying drinking and carousing. After months of travel over land and sea, and faced with constant threat since entering Connacht, they had good reason to celebrate their arrival and proximity to their destination across the Moy. Their leadership made an announcement which was reported back to Bingham by a priest who had been taken prisoner from Banada Abbey but later escaped. Edmund MacCostello found the priest in the countryside near Banada Abbey. What he told Bingham revealed a great deal about the intentions and aspirations of these new arrivals in Ireland. He reported that the Scots were most assuredly all encamped at Ardnery and that they proclaimed the whole country to be theirs. They were announcing that Bingham had returned to Roscommon and that his troops had forsaken him and that whoever came to them would receive a Cade Meal of Falcha or 100,000 welcomes and would come to no harm. Bingham asked the priest to escort him to where the Scots were camped but he declined, volunteering two local O'Hara men to go with them instead. Spies were sent to Ardnery on a reconnaissance mission and returned to Bingham with greater details soon after. Bingham now had the knowledge and the numbers to his advantage. And the Scots had their back to a raging river due to the recurring storms all summer long. The magnificent, loud-sounding, salmon-filled River Moy, which was at that time wider than the River Liffey in Dublin as it ran unchecked through the Mayo countryside. Meanwhile, Bingham had accumulated so many reinforcements that he ran out of food and sent his Captain Woodhouse off to plunder cattle in the countryside. His troops needed to refresh themselves with Connacht beef before being sent on their deadly mission. Bingham seized his opportunity, knowing that the Scots were prevented by the force of the River Moy from escaping from their camp on the Ardnery side, which was then in County Sligo, to getting across the Moy without bridges to their allies on the Mayo side of the river. Nowadays, the Balaná side on the west bank of the river is connected by four bridges to the Ardnery side. At this time in history, the town of Balaná did not yet exist on the west bank of the Moy. After recent storms, the River Moy was a force of nature to be reckoned with. Today we know that around 700 to 800 tonnes of water per second flows down the majestic river after heavy rain. In the 1500s, the river was untamed and flowed unchecked by walls and was much wider than the Moy we know today. It is presumed that the Scots were waiting for the flooded river to subside before crossing to their destination. Under the light of the moon, Bingham's army set out towards the Scots camp. The route taken was a clear by Halla, Doreen, Graffy, and Lissard Moore, where the main encounter between both military personnel would later take place, then stealthily onwards towards the river. The English army had now swelled to 3,000 but they crept silently through the passageways in the trees, keeping low at all times as they passed the foot of the Ox Mountains. Bingham's army moved three miles under cover of the canopy of trees. 
and after travelling over another mile of hard ground, Bingham gave the order to halt and waited for the remainder of his forces to catch up. Bingham gave the order to stop and prepared to give battle orders at the snub of the hill of the Ox Mountains. He cared not about the scenic beauty around him, not lake, nor dale, nor hill, as he pondered on his enemy. Would this be the day he would overthrow them? It is expected that Bingham gave a dramatic and rousing address to his troops, which included their entitlement to the spoils of Connacht, and that the Scots had come to take from them what they saw as rightfully theirs. It would later become obvious that the orders also contained the command, no quarter, not even to women and children. The code of chivalry, if not long before, ended that day at Ardnery. The River Moy rises at the foot of the Ox Mountains in County Sligo. It flows for 110 kilometres. For the greater part of its length, it flows southwestward, entering County Mayo and passing near Swinford, before passing through Foxford, then turning north and heading for the town of Ballina, where it meets the ocean tide and continues out into Killala Bay. The Moy estuary is eight kilometres long, beginning at Ballina and running into Killala Bay. The long-term average flow rate of the River Moy into Killala Bay is 61.5 cubic metres per second but after a weather event can force much more per second into the sea, which it meets where Ardnery meets Ballina in the town centre. Today, in 2021, the Moy, as it is known, is one of the most prolific salmon rivers in Europe, with an estimated rod catch of between 8 and 12,000 salmon annually. Throughout the weeks of cat and mouse played by Bingham and the Scots, nature's power was used by both armies, the moon for light, the storm to move in secrecy, the lay of the land for battle. On that fateful day in 1586, the River Moy was used by the English army as a weapon of mass destruction. At 10 a.m., Bingham and his cavalry headed southwards towards the Scots camp, followed by his infantry troops at a quick march. On the outskirts of the camp at Ardnery, they paused. Then suddenly, a small number of English cavalry led by Bingham rode into the camp to see where the Scots lay and to cause panic as they slay the unsuspecting civilians and military. The horsemen rode right in beside the camp of the sleeping Scots. The Galloglass had sentries on duty who fired at passing horsemen who then withdrew to invite a chase. This was a trap. The Scots who stood guard outside the camp fired on the group of English horsemen, unaware that they were being followed by a large cavalry division and a whole army of footmen. Many of them were still sleeping when the attack began, although their fighting prowess was immediately put into full effect once they awoke to the screams of their people being slaughtered. They scarcely fired their first round of arrows and musket balls before the enemy was on top of them. The English account of what happened says that the way the Scots were sleeping in their couches. This refers to the beds in the local community, as the rule was the warriors got the beds and the best food available as their pay for their military service when in a region. When the Galaglass warriors arose from their beds and organized their defensive positions, it was not long before they advanced towards their attackers. Bingham held the advantage of the high ground in the plains of Atinas, and from here he could direct operations out of range of a Galloglass sword, axe or arrow. His plan was unfolding exactly as he had wanted. Up until now each side was involved in a series of manoeuvres with neither side committing to a set piece battle. This was about to change dramatically. The Galloglass fighters marched forward to meet the royal troops in their greatest bravery according to English army reports. They would have been happy to put distance between the English attackers to their front and their families to their rear. But they did not realize that they were being lured into an area of bog and lake and that the terrain was to become a major factor in this battle. As they moved forward, they were surrounded from the flank by hundreds of Bingham's cavalry who were driving them towards ground where they would find it impossible to defend themselves or to launch a counter-attack. 
He was buying time, for he knew that his infantry was advancing silently, completely unknown to the Scots, who were oblivious to their impending arrival. These were loose shot and archers who used musket balls and arrows to attack their enemy. They moved engaged in skirmishes with the Galloglass, and then retreated further back than they had advanced, and he repeated this several times in buying time tactical withdrawals. Having lived through over a hundred battles, he was obviously not one to put himself in unnecessary danger. From the hilltop at Lissard Moor, it was possible to survey the landscape and to direct his large army in the next phase of the battle. When the Lushot, who were armed with muskets and matchlocks, arrived at the battlefield, Bingham and the cavalry violently charged the Galloglass and drove them into a small bog. He killed as many as possible there before retreating. Then he ordered his cavalry to dismount and together with the newly arrived loose shot and infantry drove the panic-stricken civilians and some of the warriors of the ill-fated Scott Galloglass camp towards the River Moy in complete terror. Very few parts of the greater Atty Mass or Bunny Conlon or Ardnery area escaped the horrors that were about to unfold. The sight of around 3,000 Scots, including half of them women and children, being attacked and slaughtered by a 3,000 strong, well-equipped and fiercely motivated army was an unwelcome one to this serene and beautiful countryside. From Carrickerbley, where most civilians died, to Mullahowney, Clunagun, to Clunishlon, Carrawar, to Bowfield, and for the Scott military, especially Lissard Moor, all witnessed the horror story unfold as the besieged Scots ran for their lives in all directions and scattered throughout the countryside, woodland, bogs, lakes and river. They waded through the lake breast deep in water, hence the name Loch Brawley, Lake of the Breasts, or Lake of Agitation. With the English army firing frantically on them from higher ground and desperately trying to escape, Many of the Scots made it across to the other side of the lake. The Scots failed in their attempt to cross Loch Brawley at the south end and changed course up along the western coast of the lake. All the time they were under English attack from the higher ground, where Bingham commanded from the peak some 100 feet above. They were prevented from crossing at a then fjord on the north side of the lake and were forced to take to a field. Luf Nefala, and many were killed. The remaining warriors were finished off at Clutton Le Malakta. Many were buried in a field 250 yards southwest of Clutton Le Malakta in a three cornered field called Garda Punta or Pound Field. The terrain and the element of surprise were critical factors in deciding the battle, as well as the fact that the Scots were outnumbered and outgunned by the English army. The immediate aftermath of this part of the battle saw the Scott women calling for their loved ones. The words, call will to, call will to, where are you, where are you, could be heard, before the distraught women fell to their knees and cursed the ground where their men fell. On the western side of Lissard Moor Road, there is a field called Pound Field, Garda Ponte. It is said in local folklore that the Scott women, who were known by locals as North women, went down on their knees and cursed the hollows. This place was known as the Stony Place of the Curses. In the south of this field is a smaller field called the Bloody Hollows, Falam Agar. This, according to stories passed down through the generations, is where much blood was spilled on that day in September 1586. Southwest of the Bloody Hollow, there is a deep spring well. It is said that the local people collected the discarded weapons of the Galloglass 
and put them into this well. The attack continued with ferocity as the bulk of the civilian non-combatants ran towards the River Moy in fear for their lives, and not without justification. Bingham's orders had yet to be carried out in full. With the bulk of the Galloglass fighters killed or badly injured, the English now had free reign in the camp. The camp of around 3,000 people would have been spread across miles of countryside and would have included hundreds of tents. Many more houses were also present throughout the various townlands of Arimas. The fear and trauma of locals and Scots alike must have been unimaginable. Trapped between a raging river and a crazed army hell-bent on mass murder, their fate was sealed and they must have known it. Many approached the river in such haste that they did not stop at its banks, but plunged right into its watery depths and were quickly carried downstream in the strong post-storm current. It was common for the dead to have their heads removed for the dual purpose of the soldiers collecting their head money, but also could be put on display on pikes in the pale as a deterrent to other potential rebels. Human skulls were also used for medicine for many years. Because of events on mainland Europe with various conflicts and power struggles, Irish loyalty, or lack of it, was becoming an urgent matter for Queen Elizabeth, and she was very mindful of her enemies of France and Spain joining forces with the Irish and causing her much bigger problems. Many attempts were being made at this time to civilize the Irish, including the introduction of Sir Walter Raleigh. Of the thousands of Scots who were camped at Ardenry that day, some reports say that not a single soul survived. Bingham's own version of events claims that a small number, maybe around 100, were allowed to live, having witnessed the slaughter, and that this was done with the intention of spreading fear and breaking future resistance among anyone with rebellious inclinations. It is reported that between 80 and 100 strong Scott warriors were able to strip of their battle dress and swim to the other side of the river only to be met by George Bingham, who, it is said, took great pleasure in killing the weakened or vulnerable. Some accounts also say that some who were loyal to the Burke clan were also involved in the killing of those who were among the Scots to reach their destination of Tyrolli, albeit for just a brief moment. Ardenry Castle was next in Bingham's sights. The castle stood on top of Palmyra, also known as Castle Hill, built by early settlers at Ardenry on the east bank of the River Moy. This is probably the oldest man-made structure in the town. It is written in English military accounts of the day that Bingham paid for the entire cost of the rebellion in Connacht with the loot taken from Ardenry Castle in the aftermath of the bloody massacre. In his letter to Lord Deputy Perrault on the day after the battle, in his discourse, Sir Richard Bingham says the number of their fighting men slain and drowned that day we estimated and numbered to be fourteen or fifteen hundred, besides boys, women, churls and children, which could not be so few as so many more and upwards. Captain Thomas Woodhouse says he was never so weary of slaying men, for as fast as he could he did, but hoe them and pouch them, sometimes on horseback and sometimes on foot the time not permitting him to dispense the coup de grace to the victims. And when all was over, they counted the victory at the half rate and reckoned but 900 slain. When it really turned out that the numbers of foe were double, there is no reason to suppose that these Scots wanted in any of the other qualities of their race, except perhaps that their generals were young. It would later prove controversial but in a relatively minor way that the English army under Bingham certainly slaughtered the Scots at Ardenry, but they were the subjects of a sovereign at peace with Queen Elizabeth. In a letter to Archbishop Loftus in the Pale, Bingham wrote from Ardenry the day after the massacre, The Lord God of hosts, by whose mighty arm we obtain this happy victory, be blessed and praised for it. Bingham went on to write of the fate of the Scots leaders. 
Alexander Cara, one of James MacDonald's sons, body was in the water, his head was brought to me, and most of their gentlemen be killed. It is thought that Donald Gorm, another of James MacDonald's sons, is also slain. The certainty whereof shall be known better a day or two hence than now. He concluded the letter with the words, I beseech your lordship to let the rest of the council understand of it, that we may rejoice together in the Lord. In an English military letter sent from Dublin on September 29, 1586, from Geoffrey Fenton, Principal Secretary of the State in Ireland for Queen Elizabeth I, to Walsingham, the Queen's spymaster, who was the equivalent to the head of the Secret Service nowadays. He wrote, This overthrow happened in good time, both to terrify others of this nation that had like pretenses, and also to stay and settle the minds of many that news after change. While many men and horses were badly injured that day, no Crown forces fatalities in battle were reported. However, two English soldiers died plundering the dead and injured bodies in the river. The local people of Ardenry and Adimas and Bonnyconlin were met with a tragically sad and horrifically brutal scene the next morning when they emerged from their homes. They came out to bury the many, many dead and were faced with mothers clutching babies dead on the rocks and grassy banks of the Moy. Four years after the massacre in 1590, on April the 6th in Athlone, Richard Bingham wrote to Walsingham, the Queen's secretary. We spent 16 days in Tiroli, spoiling the country and putting the people to the sword. The blind abbot's legs were, was cut clean off with a blow of the sword and buried, and the Burks reckon him now but as a dead man. We took 2,000 cows and 300 head of great cattle and burned 1,200 sticks of corn besides the havoc of all things else. The expedition was successful and the Seps have submitted and have agreed to pay the cost of the war and to dismiss all strangers from their countries. The Galloglass Scots, they were very few known survivors from the battle and many of those who died did not receive any kind of burial except what the river and sea provided. Some graves are marked with a single stone in a lonely Mayo field, far from the highlands of Scotland, where they came from earlier that same summer. Ustin MacDonald, the leader of the Mayo Galaglas, who was present at Ardenry, but was later that year pardoned for his involvement, was arrested by Bingham in 1588 on the grounds that he was fomenting rebellion. Providing aids to Spaniards washed ashore from shipwrecks of the Spanish Armada and actively preventing the collection of the composition of Connacht. He was executed under martial law at Dunamona Castle in West Mayo. The Gaelic Irish claimed that MacDonald had voluntarily met Bingham to complain about the behaviour of the royal troops and that he had been killed while under protection, which would constitute a clear breach of faith on Bingham's part. The ill feeling caused by this execution contributed to the outbreak of further rebellion the following year. Gráinne Whale, who transported the Scots and was stranded in Ulster due to storm damage during the battle, died on the 18th of June, 1603, at the age of 73. She is buried in the ruins of the Abbey on Clear Island. The Burks and other Mayo clans suffered many losses of their clan's people before, during and after the Battle of Ardnery, but their descendants still live today and have strong connections to the town of Ballina, which was founded around Ardnery. Queen Elizabeth I died the same year as Gráinne Whale on the 24th of March 1603, aged 73, at Richmond Place on the banks of the River Thames, London. John Perrault later returned to England and was accused of treason against the Crown by his many enemies. Before being found guilty and sentenced to death, he cried out against the prosecution, You win men's lives away with words. He died in the Tower of London at the age of 64, possibly of poisoning, in the year 1592. Although it was the fractured and conflicting Irish clans that allowed and even invited the English invasion, it was only when the O'Donnells joined the Burks that Bingham became powerless and, on the insistence of Gráinne Whale of Queen Elizabeth I, was removed from office in Connacht. He was also outsmarted by Red Hugh O'Donnell in 1595, before his removal from the province. 
He was later appointed Marshal of Ireland and General of Leinster. In 1588, he married Sarah Hyman, but his Dorset estates were inherited by a son of his brother, George, so they had no surviving heir, but Richard and Sarah had a daughter, Martha Bingham. Richard Bingham died of sickness under a Dublin sky at the age of 71 on the 19th of January, 1599, the very same year that Oliver Cromwell was born. Bingham has, to this day, a centipath in his honour at Westminster Abbey, which boasts of his military exploits throughout his career, including his war crimes at Ardenry. For with the benefit of hindsight, it is perfectly clear that Richard Bingham was a psychotic genocidal murderer who had an insatiable thirst for Irish blood and left a scar on the province of Connacht. While his name may be revered in Westminster, it was certainly not among the people of Connacht who despised him and his brothers and their army for their inhumane cruelty to the people. George Bingham, Sheriff of Sligo, was killed in Ballymote Castle by Tibbet Burke, son of Gráinne Whale, after an attack on St Mary's Abbey, Rathmullen, County Donegal, several years after the Ardenry Massacre. He was buried in Christchurch Cathedral, Dublin, on the 27th of September, 1599. John Bingham's date of death and burial place are currently unknown. Many questions and what-ifs arise from this tragic story. What if the Scots had succeeded in reaching their final destination of North Mayo? What if Gráinne Whale had repaired her storm-damaged ship in Ulster and returned to lead the Galloglass army at Ardnery? What if this was the defining moment that could have altered the course of Irish history? Is Battle of Ardnery a misnomer? Should it have been called Massacre at Atty Mass or Slaughter at Bonnie Conlon? Either way, it was an enormous human tragedy. It was the greatest single loss of life in a few hours of Ireland's 700-year conflict with England. From the Oxford English Dictionary, Massacre, an indiscriminate and brutal slaughter of many people. Genocide, the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. Queen Elizabeth I and her representative in Ireland, Sir John Perrault, Lord Deputy, claimed jurisdiction over Ireland on that day in 1586. The leaders responsible for the state-sponsored genocide and mass murder of innocent at Ardnery were Sir Richard Bingham, Governor of Connacht, George Bingham, Sheriff of Sligo, John Bingham, Captain of the Footmen, Sir Henry Dowra, Captain Nicholas Mordant, Captain Murrayman, Mr. Newton, Captain Mustard, Captain Woodhouse, Captain Green O'Malloy, Captain Bettage, John Newton, Scoutmaster, Richard Batall, Guidemaster. The battle and lead up to Ardnery reflect the divisions and weaknesses of Gaelic opposition to English aggression during the late Tudor period. Inter-clan feuding, succession disputes and divided loyalties against a determined and opportunistic enemy, united and strong under one monarch, left every Gaelic leader in Ireland to fend for themselves during one of the most traumatic periods of social and political upheaval and change in the history of Connacht and of Ireland. But what did it achieve in the long term? Was it worth the enormous loss of life? Was it all for nothing? Or did this war achieve anything? Because today, in the year 2021, this town is a free, diverse, multicultural and secular community whose inhabitants live happily side by side in peace. And Ardnery stands tall, strong and proud in a free Connacht in Ballina County Mayo on the banks of the River Moy.